it was DevOps for front end developers who can't back end code good and want to learn how to do other stuff good too. <laughs> there were a lot of Zoolander references. And then everyone was tweeting me and my husband's like, why do people keep asking if you're building Drupal for ants? I don't understand this. And then we got to watch Zoolander together. <laughs> That's, uh, yep, I'm gonna chill. Wow, there were a lot of people. I was so worried that there were not gonna be a lot of people. And simultaneously, I was like, oh, I'm very tired. Hopefully, everyone else is tired. Noah, I forgot. Uh, Noah, can you hear me? No, it's okay. Maybe I'll go outside. I don't remember if it's recording right now or not. It's okay. <clears throat> this is my uh, first in-person DrupalCon where I'm presenting slides, uh, where I'm doing a presentation. It was a big goal of mine, so this is very exciting for me. So thank y'all for coming. I called my dad and he kind of forgot what DrupalCon was, but he was like, I'm very excited for you. <laughs> yeah, right. My husband gets Drupal and React mixed up sometimes. So it's like, the, yeah, everyone's generally supportive. All right. <clears throat> Cool, okay, the clicker works. Good morning, y'all. Uh, welcome to my talk on inequity and isolation, inclusive practices for remote teams. Uh, my name is Taryn Almendares. I almost said Glover, that was my old name. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am the current lead of the Drupal Diversity and Inclusion Initiative in Drupal. I am also a developer advocate at Pantheon. My Drupal.org username is Nine Lives Black Cat. No one told me my first DrupalCon that they were going to print that on my badge. <laughs> it was my gamer tag, so. <laughs> um, I'm very thrilled to have y'all here, and we're just going to go get started. Um, also, I can tell y'all more about the Drupal Diversity and Inclusion Initiative. Uh, we meet every other Thursday, not this Thursday in the Drupal Slack and the Diversity and Inclusion channel. Uh, we support marginalized and underrepresented people in Drupal, as well as the people that are trying to support them, because diversity and inclusion and equity are hard, and nobody should have to do it by themselves. So, this talk comes about because the old workplace model that we had before was dead. Uh, if I can ask folks, show of hands, how many people had ever been told, well, hey, I understand you want to ro work remotely, but that's just not a thing that we can do. Happened to me when I was working in local government. And then I left, and then the pandemic showed up, and all of a sudden, everybody was able to work remotely. Um, and even as things are getting better, um, employees are still eager to continue working remotely or hybrid. Some people do want to go back to the office. Um, there's a survey by FlexJobs. About 58% of the respondents do want to be full-time remote employees after the pandemic is over. 39% of people want a hybrid work environment. So 97% of people that are working want to continue to do remote work. It's pretty nice. Get to hang out with my dogs at lunch without having to drive really far, right? So uh, let's see. So huzzah for remote work. It's great. It's fun. Get to see our dogs. These are some stats um, from shrm.org. I tend to stat drop a lot, but I'm gonna give some context here. Apologies to those uh, who are looking at this slide and the colors are not very different. This is directly from them. I will give some context here. Um, sorry. Uh, women and men agreed on, sorry. This shows women and men's responses. It is binary. I, we understand that gender is non-binary, but that's how they collected their data. Um, they do generally agree 
that when they are working remotely, that they're more productive, they do tend to work more hours, women actually report being more productive than men. And female remote workers say that their biggest concern is about working longer hours, having fewer opportunities to network and form relationships. And men, more so than women, think that managers will view them negatively if they work from home. So sometimes men want to go back in the office because they don't want to be seen as somebody that's not working. There's a stigma that work that is done in the home is not actual work, society, patriarchy. Those are things that we are navigating as we are going into this new context of work. As work comes into our homes, we have to break down a lot of these myths. Just some more data here. But in addition to uh, there being a differentiation between how people think about the work environment based on gender, there's also different perceptions when we are looking at um, race in this. Uh, black workers who are in so-called knowledge jobs like tech, um, they have actually felt as if working from home, working remotely is much better for them. Would anyone like to guess why? If you were at the nonprofit summit, I actually spoiled this answer. Part of it is because there are less microaggressions that you have to deal with. You can focus on the work that you have at hand. Um, uh, opposed to that, 39% of folks who identify as Asian or Asian American and are women feel that remote work will actually hinder their ability to perform and succeed in the workplace. Um, this is in large part because they feel like there will be fewer networking opportunities for them. Um, for white women and people of mixed ethnicities, only 25% of folks felt like they would have those opportunities kept from them. 14% of black women and 12% of Hispanic and Latino women also shared the sentiment that it'd be okay to work from home sometimes. So as we can see, many groups do benefit from home arrangements, work from home arrangements, and lots of people feel like there's some stigma associated with it. Um, in particular, folks who are disabled have more opportunities to be present in the workplace, to be able to do their work, to take the breaks that they need to without being forced into like a constant eight to five workplace. Um, I just remember that I can take off my mask while I am speaking. <laughs> it's hard to breathe through it and I've been doing that at the Pantheon booth all week. <laughs> um, one thing that we do need to keep in mind is that with the COVID-19 pandemic and the after effects that are happening, there will be a lot more disabled persons in our uh, society. In 2021, 1.2 million more people were identified as having a disability than there were in 2020. So it's important that we make adjustments to our workplaces, to our environments, and to our expectations in order to accommodate everyone along these spectrums. This was actually pretty neat from the, uh, non the research that I did for the nonprofit summit. Um, women make up the majority of the nonprofit workforce. Uh, that industry was hit particularly hard by the pandemic, um, but with being able to have more people working remotely, you're no longer tied down to, oh, well, this person has to live in my immediate locality in order to help us out, in order to make a difference um, in this. Uh, women are usually the folks that are mothers. Um, and there were a lot of hardships faced by those groups um, during the pandemic, with there being schooling via Zoom, as well as work via Zoom. Um, and to attract top-notch employees, employers are having to consider these things. But the point of this talk is that access, telling people you can work from home, is not the same as inclusion or equity. So how do we do better? Um, some uh, this will be like the last statistic that I put in here is that while people were given more opportunities to work from home, only about 20% of folks in general could work from home, the nature of their jobs. Um, for folks that were of Hispanic origin, only one in six of those folks could work from home and only one in five black workers were able to. This is compared to one in four white workers and two in five 
uh, Asian American Pacific Islander workers. So there's a lot of work that we've got to do to make sure that there's equitable access um, and equivalent accesses. And also for the groups that were most impacted by the pandemic, not being able to social distance and work from home kind of had devastating effects. So we're gonna look at three challenges today and how we can tackle them, uh, what the sources of these challenges are, the impact on people, and the mitigations that workplaces can put in place to help everybody, or at least more people, be able to work from home. So challenge number one, somebody might have a home work environment that's not exactly suited for work from home. Uh, my first work from home job, I was working at Lullaby. Loved it, was so excited. Like I said, I got to work with my dogs. Um, I am a person that is neurodivergent. I have an attention deficit disorder. And the lack of structure that resulted from like, okay, I go to the office, I do the things at the office, I have my eight to five, this is fine, I go home, that wrecked havoc on my brain. I wasn't sure what to do. Thankfully, I had mentors that helped me with it, right? I see snaps, cool. Thanks for that feedback, it's helpful. Um, Thankfully, I had mentors that helped me to go through it and adjust throughout the way. I had a coworker, um, sorry, I had a work environment of folks that had done this for several years, right? But if you are in an, a situation where you're an employer, where this is brand new for you, everybody's trying to figure it out together. Um, and sometimes we end up failing. Some other considerations aside from the structure would be internet connections. Lots of people, uh, we're doing their intensive internet browsing at work, and the internet that they had at home, if they had it at home, was subpar compare in comparison. Um, uh, people do feel less connected as well uh, as human beings. I think we talked about this already. And you've got people that are less technologically savvy that are suddenly sent a laptop and told, hey, work. For me, I have my husband who is much, 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 much deeper knowledgeable about computers. I know about computers. My husband breathes computers. I have an IT guy that's down the hall from me. When you're not in a work environment anymore, you can't just go down and be like, hey, Stan, what's up with my laptop? I don't understand it. Um, so some of the folks that are impacted in these groups include low-income workers and workers in rural areas, right? If we are putting cat videos into the company Slack, that autoplay, maybe Betsy out in the country is not gonna be able to do her work uh, with that. Um, the impacts of this is that folks have poor meeting quality. If you've been in a Zoom meeting where all of a sudden it and then that's what usually happens. <laughs> um, and with this happening, you have folks that are, either they feel that they're unable to work remotely, right? That's gonna impact how they feel about their work, or the employer's gonna be like, well, it's just not working out, because you don't have the, just how some folks were limited from being able to be employed, because they didn't have adequate con transportation, through the way our society is structured, transportation on the internet also sometimes precludes people from being able to pursue work. Um, lots of folks that wanted to be able to get into a job where they could work remotely were not able to because they didn't have the infrastructure. But thankfully there are ways that we can mitigate this. Uh, we <laughs> employers can mitigate this. Um, one thing that I believe is one of the strongest ways is to do this is by providing tech stipends to workers. These are gonna be things like paying for the internet access for someone, paying for a mobile hotspot um, if the high speed internet is not available in the home. I live in a nice area of Dallas, Texas now where I have fiber internet. I stream all the cat videos and the video games at the same time, but I have neighbors down the street that don't have the same access to that internet rate. Um, you can also do, um, some employers do choose to pay for the phones for their employees if they need that, right? Who among us has a landline at home? Um, lots of my relatives use prepaid phones and that's not really a thing for, that's suited for office environments. Um, 
Another cool way that employers can help with this is by having equipment stipends, as well as having um, equipment standards that you articulate to someone, right? Like I said, I know about computers, but like I don't know about computers. Uh, when Pantheon sent me over my MacBook to work on, I was like, all right, it's a Mac. I'm a Windows user, I don't understand this. And my husband's like, they sent you a MacBook? Whatever it is, sorry Matt that I don't know what it is. But I was like, oh, okay, cool, I guess this works. So if I, a person that is employed in tech full time, don't know these stats, like don't make your workers go out and do the research and have to have their own opinions about it. Do that research for them, help them out in those ways. Um, there's also the fact that right now, you know, the pandemic is winding down, but giving a stipend or allowance for folks to have remote offices, um, if they're a person that you know needs that structure, needs that separateness, um, or a stipend, uh, maybe not just technical equipment, but like a desk that would help out, right? Um, whether that's sitting, standing, anything like that. Um, fortunately, employers, a lot of these things are tax deductible. So by you helping someone else get to equity, that also helps you. The next challenge that we'll talk about is onboarding and cultural norm setting. Now, a lot of the causes for this, not a lot of opportunities to just run into people in the hallways. Usually I am just tripping over my dogs in the hallway because when they hear me get on the Zoom call, they're like, oh, it's time for petting. It's time to get on Zoom. I can't really network with my dogs. They're not very good referrals on LinkedIn. <laughs> I tried. Um, another thing is that um, Employers, sometimes when we are doing remote work, right, folks get focused on the work. It's like, all right, we got a task, we got to do the task, and we forget about all of the things that help a task work. Maybe like we're just sitting and talking, and I just happen to go in the coffee room, and you're like, hey, how are you doing today? I'm like, I'm good, how are you? And you're like, well, I'm working on this thing with a website, and I'm not exactly sure how this is working, and I can be like, hey, I actually have had that problem. Let me come over to your cube and help you out with that. If we're not, those things happened organically, but we have to work on intentionally replicating that and not get focused on productivity. Productivity is important, but productivity is often a byproduct of all these beautiful, organic, human things that we do. We can't strip humanity out of our processes at work. It just doesn't work out. It also makes people leave because they feel discouraged. Um, it's, this is uh, especially troublesome for people from marginalized backgrounds, as we discussed. Everyone has like a different perception of it, right? But you know, a lot of I was fortunate to grow up middle class. I am college educated. Um, there were a lot of things that I knew, but there were a lot of things that I realized that I didn't know. And just having coworkers that came by, saw that I was working on something, I was able to grow and learn from that. Um, you don't know what you don't know. Uh, I have cousins that, you know, hmm, I was gonna go into a personal anecdote there. I'll shove it in the box. And thank you for being understanding about it. Um, the impact here is that it will impact folks getting promoted. It will impact uh, employee retention. Um, the ways that we can mitigate this in remote working environments is through the creation of mentorship and networking programs. I know especially in the Drupal community, that is a thing that is hard. That is a thing that I've seen lots of folks working on. How do we make sure that we're getting these high quality websites out, especially if you're at an agency, right? And it's like, do we have time to onboard somebody into this whole Drupal way of doing things with Drupal 7, 8, 9, 10 while still hitting these deadlines? You have to make it important. You have to understand that it is going to impact your product in the long term if you don't make room to train in both the technical and personal aspects. Uh, someone asked a very great question in the nonprofit summit and they said, um, well, I know that sometimes employers are concerned with, well, what if I spend all this time training this person and they leave? And someone else responded with a Henry Ford quote that said, the worst, the thing that is worse 
than having an employee that is well trained and leaves is having an employee that's not trained at all that stays. Was that you? Yeah. Yeah. So um, having these mentorship and networking programs is going to ensure that the quality of your workers is going to go up and those workers remembering how they were treated, how other folks helped them out, that builds a culture where the next person in, we're helping them to learn and grow. Um, I have it in my notes, it says mandatory programs. Um, and I put it that way because sometimes we say as employers and workplaces, hey, we, highly, we, we think that this is an important thing. But without telling a person, hey, Matt, this five hours of your week, you need to go and you're going to mentor these new people that came in. If it's optional and it's not something that's specifically targeted toward these productivity goals that we are putting people toward, they're like, well, do I spend five hours helping Taryn learn how to use her MacBook or do I put that five hours on getting this project over the line? The way that capitalism has structured our society, most people are going to make that choice to excel and hit their goals and leave the other person behind. Not because people are malicious, but because everybody is just trying to make it, right? Especially right now. Um, but yeah, this is why it's important and critical to organizational culture. Um, with onboarding, we don't send people handbooks, notebooks, and sometimes, the uh, related to the previous one, the knowledge that's in our heads that we can organically just share with folks, if we don't have that documented and also listed where it's documented, how people can access it, even a training path for it, people are lost. They show up and they're like, well, here's your task that you've got to do. It's like, but we're, if somebody asks you to build a shed and they're like, well, here's the instructions for the shed. If they don't tell you where the toolbox is or where the instructions are, I mean, you can wander around looking for the toolbox, but that's also going to hurt your productivity for your workers. So um, especially in remote environments, that's a thing that we've got to be intentional about. The last challenge that I'll talk with you all about today is access to the mentorship and growth opportunities. Um, I believe that I ended up talking about this earlier, but um, just being able to do things like employee resource groups, right? Where people are coming together, talking about their similarities and differences. Um, having, we, we had some really great speakers that came in in the month of February, for example, at Pantheon. And part of it was for Black History Month, but a lot of it was around just people coming in to talk to you not necessarily people that were within your employment group, but trainings that folks could have access to, right? You don't have to have it where your employees who are burdened with um, doing the work of their work have to also be the trainers. Hire people to come in. This is another thing that is tax deductible. Have someone come in, do the trainings, give the opportunities. It will help everyone to be able to flourish. Um, and it's just a way, it's a great way to show folks that you care about investing in them. So I was trying really hard to not like have a very long data driven talk. So it looks like I'm 21 minutes into this and I suppose I will open it up for questions if folks have questions. I'm usually going over time, so now I'm like, oh, what do I do? Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, you talked before about the employer now. Hmm. Access to mentorship and growth opportunities. And earlier, we were talking about how access is not an equation. Mm -hmm. I wonder, can you dive in a little bit more into how we go from just making sure that available to making sure that it is Yes, so for the recording, the question was, on this slide I have access to mentorship and growth opportunities, but previously I said access is not equal to growth and equity for a person. Um, with this, it's more discussing the fact that, so sorry, for the first slide with access, like saying, yes, you can work remotely. Like, 
that ability to do a thing is not guaranteeing that a person will be able to do it well. With this one, we have trainings that, this is providing access to trainings, the mentorship and the growth opportunities as a whole, right? Like having that even be available on the table. So I believe that it would dovetail into providing the access and making sure that people understand that it is important that it becomes part of our, either a person's job responsibilities, um, our organizational culture. Does that kind of explain the differentiation? Yeah. Yeah, I actually had like a, a image that had people like stair stepping and I was like, they're gonna think that's cheesy, I'm not gonna put this in here. So yes, definitely. Like giving people the path to grow from, right? Like you, you could go walking like in the Texas woods, right? I talk about Texas because that's my thing. But if somebody's carved out a path, maybe you're less likely to step on a rattlesnake that could poison you, right? Um, yeah, that metaphor, yes. Yes, uh, for the recording, the question is, and I'm gonna summarize it, Mike, if that's okay, um, that the asker has an organization where it's overwhelmingly white and male, and so being able to do these steps for including folks, and just to remind you, you know, there are other groups outside of minorities, which I'm, I know that you know. Um, I'm a minority, I'm a woman. I'm heavily invested in making sure that people of marginalized races, ethnicities, and genders get in, but also there's folks that have neurodivergencies. Just putting that out there awkwardly. Um, how do we even start, before we can even give access, how do we do outreach? Um, that is not the focus of what I am saying here, and I say that because I went to a really dope talk by Frederick Mitchell, who was one of my old bosses, but he's also like super smart, where it talks about, uh, it was how math, science, and Star Trek explain the value of diversity. It's great, and one of the things that he discusses in there is um, that in order to break this tech pipeline, we have to break the idea that we are trying to solve the diversity problem. You have to flip this concept upside down. You look at a person that is applied, and instead of saying, well, do they hit the marks? You say, well, this person has applied. How does this person help me to achieve the goals of my organization? Um, I heavily encourage like watching that talk because he puts it like so much better than I can right now. Um, another thing that I have seen employers do and that we encourage in the diversity and inclusion initiative is reaching out to groups that, you know, might have, uh, sorry, there are networking groups on like Meetup. Um, there's even Facebook groups. I'm in a couple of Facebook groups that are specifically for black women in tech, but putting your job postings there, um, uh, Avi, if I can pick on you, like just doing like organic talking with folks. Um, I sometimes go and I talk to different folks that are running Drupal camps to help them figure out how do we get more people 
from diverse backgrounds. So if you're in Drupal, you can come and talk to folks in the Drupal Diversity and Inclusion Initiative, but there are people that want to help you to be able to do those things. So job boards, uh, special interest groups, meetup groups, networking activities that are for those folks. Don't, none of them saying this, don't just post there, right? Go and build the relationships. And I, I say that explicitly because sometimes we think, all right, I did the thing, I posted the thing on the wall. If the, I post it, they will apply. There's a, everybody cites this, but um, a woman will feel like she has to have 100% of the qualifications on something in order to apply. And a guy will be like, I know how to do three of those things. This is cool. And I've had to tell myself that it's okay for me to not know everything. I have a really hard time with not knowing everything. But now that I've done that and had more confidence, it's very helpful. But I had to have a lot of mentorship to get to that point. Yes. So for the recording, um, the sentiment is that if you have an employee referral program and people are like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get that sweet $10,000, that would be really cool if like, we all got $10,000 for hiring our friends, right? It's like, I know that my friend is gonna apply and they're gonna make it through and I'm gonna get 10,000 bucks and maybe I'll give them $1,000, I don't know, right? But that perpetuates sameness. You're not getting the diversity that you could have and you have a homogenized group that's incentivized through $10,000 bonuses. Thank you. Yes. Mm. And, and something like that, how do you then how does this come up with a VF um, that would not for example just the same thing that would like for like in white folks or white people? Yeah. Um so for the recording the question is as a person of a marginalized background, how do you advocate for these things? Um and you're not increasing the burden, like it's like I I would like to continue working remotely. Um, what I will say, before I address your question, is that the burden should not just be on the marginalized folks alone to advocate for themselves. Um, there's a, another quote that says, it's one thing to get an invite to the party, it's a whole other thing for somebody to bring you along. Um, I think that it is very important for people that are in adequately represented majority groups to roll up our sleeves and do the labor on this because it's not like other people don't have things that they are dealing with, right? But uh, one thing that I have said in some situations is that when I go into the workplace, I'm not trying to be black at work. And that's in part because I don't wanna put a target on my back. I don't want people to be like, ah. It, it's not always that I feel like this, Matt Sanchita, I'm not. I'm not just saying this either because y'all are in here, but it's just like, nobody wants to be the person that's making the fuss, causing the problem, because it's like, ah, well, they told us to hire you know, people of underrepresented groups and not to hire the same people, but every time we hire them, they're causing trouble, they're asking for things, so. Um, so, sorry. Don't put folks in a position where they have to advocate for themselves alone uh, for folks that are in underrepresented and marginalized identities, I think that it's important for us to be able to identify and find champions and allies in our working environments. And part of that uh, is related to, you know, this access to mentorship, access to networking opportunities, and that being a part of intentional practices. So do what you can. I totally understand, like, you know, 
wanting to preserve your rights in the workplace to be able to work remotely, but also remember that you don't have to do it alone. And for employers that might be listening to this, don't make people do this alone. Nobody can solve any of these problems by themselves. People that are allies or people that are marginalized. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I believe that part of that kind of, sorry, so how do we identify ways to advocate for these programs and the mentorship and onboarding to be improved? Um, I think that as people feel comfortable to use their voices, they should. Don't be afraid. Find ways to say things as suggestions and not necessarily criticisms, which is a thing that I've had to work on, right? Um, at the same time, employers being able to, being open to giving outlets of feedback to their employees, putting that as part of their practices is vital. Um, when I worked at Lullabot, for example, I was automatically assigned a Lullabuddy when I came in and that was somebody that was dedicated to teaching me the organizational culture, showing me how things worked. If y'all are in the Drupal community, my Lola buddy was my Kershaw, so <laughs> he, he's pretty cool, but I, I, y'all kind of see my nature, and I was like, oh no, that's the one guy at Lullabot that wears a suit, but <laughs> he, he's not like that at all. But yeah, like just being able to talk about, you know, even I had a bias, right, of my perception of who Mike might be, but, that, that grows trust and camaraderie. So I hope that answers your question. I know I went off a little bit. Yes. Thought I saw another hand raise. Yes. And then, so for the recording, um, part of that process of getting more folks in and making sure that they're supported is looking at the job position postings that we have in the first place and HR being like, do we really need somebody with a master's degree to make our Drupal 7 site? Uh -huh. that, that's not exactly what you said, but like paraphrasing for it. Um, being intentional about, we know that folks are going to be like, oh, well, I don't have everything here. And if we know that it's not all needed, why post it? Um, for another place that I worked, I helped with starting our inclusion and equity group is the way that we decided to name ourselves. And part of what we did was that when new job postings went up, uh, that group went and we examined and there were times where it's like, well, I see that this says that we need a bachelor's degree. Is this absolutely necessary or are we introducing a hurdle? And the most important thing is that we had a executive buy-in because the president of the org was a part of that group. And so we were able to have those conversations and it didn't just feel like, uh, also addressing the question from earlier, it didn't just feel like a bunch of employees belly aching, right? We knew that there was somebody in a C-suite that was gonna be there and supportive and be able to give us feedback, so thank you. Yes. Mm. 
Yeah. So to paraphrase it um, for the recording, the question is, well, yes, we're trying to do these inclusionary things. I'll send over the job description to HR. Um, but then we have a person that's charged with diversity and inclusion and they'll change some of the wording and I get more people, I get all these diverse people and then I've got to filter through what is now a large queue of folks and a lot of these people don't meet the expectations that we need for the job. Um, how do I deal with this? So, number one, I think that part of the problem there is a communication thing. Uh, I don't think it's fair to just change somebody's job posting and not have a conversation with them about, hey, uh, when we when we gave the feedback about the bachelor's degree uh, for the inclusion and equity group, right, we didn't just change it and post it out. There, This goes back to the intentionality thing. We have to be having conversations with each other where we're vulnerable and allowed to be vulnerable and discussions where Everybody has needs, whether that's as a human being or as a person working. If you need a Drupal 7 developer, sorry, I love Drupal 7, so that's why I keep using it in my examples. Um, and then I go and change it, I'm like, Bronislav, guess what? I put in here that if they have experience with Joomla, it's good, and you're like, now I have like 200 Joomla developers and this is not what I needed. Like, that's not helping you, that's causing more stress for you, that's causing more stress for the applicants that were Joomla developers that it's not a good fit for them, right? Um, I think the most important thing here is that inclusion for the sake of including people is not really inclusive. It's posturing. It's setting people up to fail. And we should be actually trying to provide more opportunities for people who are able to succeed, whether that's on the face or if given like some more support to be able to be engaged. It, it, it's about stopping exclusion of people for what might be superficial reasons rather than just saying, hey, everybody come in. So for example, I don't let everybody come to my house, right? And it's not because I don't love all of my friends because it's just because one of my friends does not understand that I have a dog that likes to eat plastic if she is left by herself. I do not know why my dog does this. She just eats a lot of plastic. And so it's like, if she is out, it's because I'm out and I'm able to monitor her, right? But my friend is constantly like, oh, well, why don't you let her out? Like, she shouldn't be in her crate. Sorry, the, the, this is, a, I'm not going to apologize. This is a personal example to say, you know, I don't have that friend over as much anymore because it's not a good match for me or her, and there's nothing wrong with that. We can still go out and hang out and be friends, but it's just a weird situation. So don't feel pressured to be inclusive just to say that you did a thing, because people can also feel when that happens. Um, I have been a person that was a diversity hire, and it feels like shit. So yeah. Yes, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. 
Okay. Right. So what it sounds like, and apologies, I am not, hopefully the way that I'm phrasing this is going to summarize it. So what it sounds like is that you are in a time crunch, and that might be something where y'all need to examine your hiring processes and timelines. Um, and that is definitely a thing I am open to talking to you about offline, uh, just because I think that that is a very complicated problem with a complicated solution. But what I would suggest is like the organization looking at the processes and timelines because it might just be like you have the CVs and it might be that you have like the, uh, what is it, like a soft interview where they're first coming in and how do we build that in while still meeting our goals and still honoring these people's commitments. Thank you for the clarification and grace when I misunderstood that. Um, and it is currently 9.15, so um, I believe that we are at time, but I am super down to talk to folks uh, afterward. Thank you so much for coming and all your intentional questions. Uh, not good luck, but I am here. The inclusion initiative is here to be a partner with you, and have a great rest of your DrupalCon.